All right, so today we're going to talk about the definition of a group, give some very basic examples of groups, and talk about the Sudoku principle, and then actually derive it. So let's just get started straight away. So first thing is, what is a group? Well, a group is a combination of two things. You have some set of elements, which we'll call G, and you have some binary operation on this set, which we'll denote for now as just a dot, kind of like a multiplication symbol. Sometimes we'll use additive notation, Sometimes we'll just use, you know, a star or something abstract. Um, so, you know, for the moment, all we know about is it's a binary operation, and we don't need to think about it as necessarily multiplication, but it might be useful. So a group is a combination of a set with a binary operation, and it satisfies four basic properties. The first one is closure. Closure says that if you take any two elements of this group, combine them with this binary operation, you get another element of the group. So it's nice and simple. You can say this formally as for all elements G1 and G2 in our set G, the product G1 times G2 is also in our set G. Okay. So this is kind of our first requirement for something to be a group. <clears throat> requirement number two is associativity. Associativity says that in a certain sense, the order in which you combine elements doesn't matter, but it's a very specific sense. So formally what it says is if you have three elements, G1, G2, and G3 in the set G, then you can combine them as G1 times G2 times G3, and you could equally well have done g2 times g3 first, and then multiply by g1 on the left. Now it's important that the actual order of the elements is staying the same. g1, g2, g3, g1, g2, g3. So we're not actually allowed to switch things around. That would be commutativity. Associativity says something more like, as long as the elements stay in the same order, we can combine them in whatever order we please as you know, to get the, the same final result. So associativity is axiom two. Number three is the existence of identities or of an identity. So specifically what this means is that our group contains an element, which we're going to call E. E is a common way of describing this element. So what we want to say is that there exists an element E in our group such that for all other elements of our group, so for all little g and big G. If we multiply g by e, we get back g. Okay. So essentially, there's some element of our group that keeps everything the same uh, under this operation. It doesn't, uh, yeah, it just holds everything fixed. It doesn't jumble anything around. So that's number three. And then number four, the final criteria for a group is that inverses exist. For every element, every element has an inverse, which is defined as a element, which when you combine them using this operation, you get the identity. Okay, so number four is inverses. Now inverses, okay, and then what this says is that for every element G in big G, there exists some other element, we'll call it G inverse, is also an element of big G, such that G times G inverse equals E. And that's all we have. If something meets these four requirements, it's a group. And commutativity is not on this list, so it's completely possible to have a group which is non-commutative, in other words, a group for which A times B does not equal B times A. The special case where this is the case, where, where where, sorry, where they are always equal. The commutative groups are called abelian groups, and they're a special category of groups that end up being a lot simpler just to, to describe in a lot of ways. But yeah, it's not, not necessarily true in the definition of a group. <clears throat> so here's the first, you know, a very simple example of a group, something like the integers mod three being our set. So our set is just the numbers zero, one, two, and then our operation is just ordinary modular addition. 
So this is an addition which flips things um, around once you get to three, it brings three, you know, loops back to zero and four goes to one and five goes to two and so on. So why is this a group? Well, it's closed. Add two integers mod three, you always get another integer mod three. Um, it's associative, ordinary addition, we know is associative. It has an identity because zero is in the group. Zero plus anything is plus any integer mod three is that same integer mod three and it has inverses. So in this case, the inverse of zero is just going to be zero. The inverse of one is going to be two. The inverse of two is going to be one. Right? You add one to two, you get zero. Two to one, you get zero. So it is a group. And one kind of nice thing that we're going to be doing a lot is we're going to be using a visual way to, um, to describe groups, which is looking at their Cayley table. So the Cayley table is basically like the generalization of a multiplication table. We have our operation here, and then we combine our elements in all possible ways. So we write 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2. And then each of these things we fill out with what the product of 0 and 1 is, or you know, what the product of the element here is with the element here. Where this one goes first, this one goes second. Um, in this case, our, our, uh, we're going to use additive notation because you know that's what we're talking about here for integers mod 3. And we can just fill out this Cayley table with what we are already familiar with. So we know 0 plus 0 is 0, 0 plus 1 is 1, 0 plus 2 is 2, 1 plus 0 is 1, 1 plus 1 is 2, 1 plus 2 is 3, which in mod 3 loops back to 0, 2 plus 0 is 2, 2 plus 1 is 0, 2 plus 2 is 1, 2 plus 2 is 4, loops back to 1. Okay, so this is called the Cayley table for the group of the integers mod 3. So this is a very simple example of a group, and you can also look at this Cayley table to kind of more easily see that it matches these axioms. So, you know, if somebody draws your Cayley table and you notice that there's an element in this in this area that's not up here or here, then you know it's not closed. Um, if there's not an element, which you know, it, for which these rows are exactly e equal to this kind of label on the top, then we don't have an identity, right? If say if this was zero two two then there would be no identity element because there would be no element that takes zero to zero, one to one, and two to two. So that's a way to see if it has identity. And inverses, again, you can just look and see, is there a zero in every row? And is there a zero in every column? If not, so let's say this one is a one over here, then one, there's no element you can find one with to get zero. So one doesn't have an inverse, right? Associativity is a little bit trickier. It's not so obvious to see just from the table that it's associative, we're going to find out that a lot of things that initially look like they should be groups are actually going to fail because of associativity. So, okay, so that's a note. So we have our Cayley diagrams. And now, the last thing I want to talk about in this video is um, if we take a look at this table, we can notice that every row and every column contains all the elements, right? One, two, zero, one, two, zero. We don't have any columns that only have two of the three elements or only one of the three elements. And we might wonder, we might think this is just a particular feature of the integers mod three. But in fact, that's not the case. In fact, you can prove it from these axioms. And um, for any group whatsoever, if you write out its Cayley table, you'll see that every column and every row, I guess every column and every row, um, is going to have all the elements of the, of the group and there's no duplicates. So, it, so in general, we have some group with some operation we'll right as the dot. And you know, we have the elements of that group, G1, G2, et cetera, up to Gn for some n. And if we fill in this table for any group whatsoever, we will always see that every single row contains all of G1 through Gn exactly one time, and every single column does the exact same thing. And this is what's called the this is what I'll call the pseudo principle. Sudoku principle because, you know, in Sudoku you, you don't have any repeats. So we can kind of say, say right over here, this over here. The Sudoku principle tells us basically that um, we have no duplicates in any of the rows or columns of the K 
Haley table. That's the Sudoku principle. Now let's just go ahead and prove it. It turns out the proof is actually very simple. And um, we're actually just going to prove half of it right now. Um, and the other half, you can kind of immediately see how you would do it uh, by looking at this first half. So what is that that we want to prove? Let's write it out formally. Um, I'll just you know write a little picture. We have our Cayley's table. And we look. let's say we look at a specific row. Let's say this is the row corresponding to some element G1. And we're going to look at two columns, two different columns. So we have some G2 and some G3, such that these, you know, these are two distinct elements of our group. So we're assuming that G2 does not equal G3. And we want to prove that the element here and the element here must be different, no matter what G1, G2, and G3 are, as long as G2 and G3 are different elements. Right? So in other words, we want to show that G1 times G2 does not equal G1 times G3. And we want to do it using just these axioms and nothing else. All right, so we're going to be very careful here. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a proof by contradiction. So we're going to assume that this is the case. We're going to assume that we have a duplicate in, in one of our rows. So Let's assume that and see if we can derive a contradiction, in which case we know that our starting assumption is false. So g1 times g2 equals g1 times g3. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to multiply on the left by g1 inverse. Now, we're allowed to do this by two facts. The first one is that inverses exist. So since g1 is an element of our group, we know that somewhere in our group there has to be g1 inverse. So we know there is an inverse. Um, the second fact is not actually something we wrote out here but it's really inherent to the definition of what we mean by equal sign, which says if you have you know, a equals b, then you can do anything to, the, to one side of the equation as long as you do the exact same thing to the other side of the equation, and you still get a true statement. So you know, 1 plus a will equal 1 plus b as long as a equals b. So we're using that kind of the definition of an equal sign along with the, the existence of inverses to go from this to g1 inverse times, now we're going to be careful, and you know there's a, there's a implicit uh, parentheses here, so we'll keep those parentheses to be clear that this is done first, and then we multiply this on the left, and this thing should be equal to g1 inverse times g1 times g3. I'm sort of running out of space. Move this up a little more. Okay. So that you can say, we well, you know this is true, I'll just say by four, by axiom four, the existence of inverses. Next thing we do is we use our, the property of associativity. So by associativity, we know that we can just shift each of these parentheses over so that we'll get g1 inverse times g1, now this is the part of the parentheses, times g2 equals g1 inverse times g1 times g3. So this is true by axiom 2, associativity, right? And now g1 inverse times g1, again, by the definition of inverses, we know that this thing is equal to our identity e. So this becomes e times g2 equals e times g3. And we know this, again, by 4. And now, by the definition of identity, so by 3, this reduces to just g2 equals g3. And there we have it. There is our contradiction. Start off assuming that we have two different columns, and we see that if we assume that these two values are the same, we end up concluding that the two columns are actually the same column, which is a contradiction, which means this thing must have been false. So there we go. We, this is the proof of the Sudoku principle. And like I said, this is only half of the proof, because technically we'd also want to show it for the column, which would be choose one column and to choose two elements on, on the left, and then go ahead and, um, and prove that you can't have duplicates. And the proof would proceed very similarly. So let me just do one quick application of the Sudoku principle. Um, 
let's look back. You know, we had integers mod three, which I'll do this actually over here again. So we have our integers mod three, our Kaylee's able for that. Um, I accidentally wrote Kaylee diagram, which is a different thing. Now let's just say, let's just look at um, any arbitrary group of size three, and let's see how far we can go using the Sudoku principle in specifying what this group must be. Okay, so we'll use multiplicative notation. Now we have three elements, so all we're saying about this group, that we have some group G, which has three elements. And one of those elements by axiom three has to be identity. So let's just make that our first column. E. And now, you know, e, e times E is always E, so we know that. We also have two other elements, call them A and B. E times A has to be A. E times B has to be B. Now, A times E is also going to be A. And B times E is going to be B. Now, one thing to notice about this, our axioms, which I've kind of been glossing over, is that our axiom tech, uh, you know, technically just says that G times E equals G. It doesn't tell us that the reverse is true, that E times G equals G. And that might seem very obvious, but that's because commutativity is very natural to us. And we don't have an assumption of commutativity here, so we can't immediately say that E times G equals G. In fact, that is going to be the case. For the identity, you can always you know, say the, the inverse of this, that E times G equals G as well. And you can prove that from these axioms, and I'll just leave that as a challenge. Okay? So anyway, so yeah, that allows us to fill in both the top row and the, t and the first column. And now we can see how far we can go with the rest of the table. Well, how about this guy? Can we say anything about this one? Well, by the Sudoku principle, we know this guy can't be A, because we have an A in you know, both the column and the row. So it can't be A, but it looks like it could be E or B, and either one works. So the Sudoku principle doesn't really fully specify the value of this guy. So that one we can't make progress with. On the other hand, we look at this guy here, so A times B, well, we have A in the row, we have B in the column. What that means is that, you know, this guy can't be A or B. The only thing left that it has, that can be, by closure, it has to be one of these three things. The only thing left that could be is E. So the Sudoku principle actually allows us to automatically fill this out. Now that we've filled this out, though, we have A and E. The only thing left for this guy is our remaining element, which is B. This one actually has to have been B all along. And we can go further because we can have A and B, which means this guy has to be E. We have B and E, which means this guy has to be A. So in fact, what we've shown here is that only assuming that we have, you know, that we have a set and operation which form a group and that it has three elements, we've actually uniquely specified the whole Cayley table. And if you look a little closer, if you kind of switch back to additive notation, so make this a plus, call E a zero, A one, and B two, what you realize is that this is actually the exact same table as this, as it had to be, because we initially said that integers mod three form a group, and it's a three element group, and we just proved here that every three element group has exactly this Cayley table. And so really a way to say this is that, you know, somebody hands you a three element group, no matter what the, that group looks like, you know that you can just relabel the elements and you know write out its Cayley table, and you'll end up with something that looks just like this. Uh, more formally, what you can say is that every three-element group is isomorphic to the integers mod three. And sometimes, if we're being a little loose with language, we'll just say that there's really only one group of size three, um, because this algebraic structure really fixes everything that we're interested in. And there's a bunch of other things that might feel psychologically different about a, about a group of size three than the integers mod, mod three. But um, it's really a relabeling. Mathematically, everything that can be said about the integers mod three can just be directly translated over to whatever group you're talking about, as long as it has size three. So yeah, this is an application of Sudoku principle. And we uh, will next use the Sudoku principle to prove um, a really powerful result which is Lagrange's theorem.